Look at the picture. See the skull. Visible Frankenstein controls. The Brain Thoughts Broadcasting Radio. The Frankenstein Earphone Radio. The latest new skull reforming to contain all Frankenstein controls. Frankenstein Control is brought to you by the circus. Come see us one last time before we close our doors after more than a hundred years. Changing cultural sensibilities about the exploitation of animals took away all the fun and the magic. We promise we won't draw bullseyes and leftover clown paint on the sides of the elephants before releasing them onto Ted Nugent's mortar <laughs> range. <laughs> I don't know. I think that's going to be a hard, pro a hard promise for them to keep. It's just so tempting. <laughs> He's already paid them in advance. Yeah. You got the clown white. What else are you going to do with it? <laughs> yep. So, like, it's kind of funny how, like, circus shit... The cruelty to, like, the animals was known for a really long time. But, like, nobody gave a shit, I guess, for, like, a decade. And then <laughs> yeah. Blackfish came out, and everyone's like, Shabu, no! These, these goddamn snowflake millennials don't want to see a Brazilian gymnast chase a lioness around on a dirt bike. <laughs> <laughs> what is this world stick? coming to? <laughs> what are our poor Brazilian gymnasts going to do with their lives now that they don't have jaguars to chase around on motorcycles? <laughs> Welcome to the Three Ring Circus that is Frankenstein Control. I'm your ringmaster today. I'm also the bearded lady, Taylor Russell. <laughs> I'm Adam, also known as Ring Number Two. Did you know I once got lost in a Walmart for three days? <laughs> What'd you live on? Just Walmart stuff? Uh, freezer food. I uh, actually got trapped in there because I went into the back room trying to find obscure '90 <laughs> cereal, and uh, wandered into a freezer and got stuck there for about three days. Fun time. And in the third ring, my name's uh, B Rye, and uh, actually, you know, if you went to Home Depot and you like compared my skin color with like the swatches of paint that they have. Uh, clown paint is the name of uh, the shade that I think you'll find would most describe me. I think anybody's ever gone to like the swatch section of like a Home Depot and when no one was looking, just put them in a big giant swastika and they called it the swastika. <laughs> I'm sure someone's tried. And then they get arrested for a hate crime. And they're like, I was just doing a dad joke. <laughs> Then they went over to Joanne Fabrics and they took the, like, the wooden letters that people have to make shit out of and they just <laughs> wrote the word Nazi. <laughs> just, <laughs> just walking down the aisle and there's like, you know, little squirrel decor and, you know, woodland stuff that's just Nazi. Just says <laughs> Nazi. Doesn't, doesn't say, you know, any racial slurs or anything like that. It just says N-A-Z-I. Simply Nazi. the word Nazi. Yep. Referring to nothing except the, the Nazi. You know. <laughs> The that was in, a, uh, lives in the corner of Joanne Fabrics. <laughs> I saw him. I went to a uh, Joanne Fabrics earlier today, and uh, I saw those letters, and they had spelled out a word that just has no context or meaning at all, like <laughs> tuft <laughs> <laughs> or grab <laughs> or wank. <laughs> like it's funny when people go in there and they they make it say dick or something. Yeah. But uh, I think it's funny. I think Tuft is way funnier, <laughs> frankly. I think that's great because, like, you expect dick. Yeah. You expect like. Butt. And it's gonna get changed. And it's gonna get changed. But who's who's gonna mess with Tuft? Who would who would who would fuck with the Tuft? <laughs> Tuft is what they called the livable part of the integral trees in the book The Integral Trees. <clears throat> that was a sci-fi book I read. Integral Trees podcast is brought to you by Ford Trucks, built Ford Tuft. <laughs> 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 that reminds me, uh, I was thinking about this uh, science fiction book that I read when I was in middle school, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it was part of a series, but I can't remember what the series was or what the the name of it was. All I remember is that the main character was a kid that, I guess his body was destroyed or he lost his original body, so he was sharing it with this little blue alien creature that mm -hmm. was uh, like small quadrupedal just instead of a head just a long stalk with an eye on the end mm -hmm. and it breathed through its skin and uh you're talking about animorphs no it's not animorphs. so you sure this isn't a nightmare you had about parasite <laughs> are you sure this isn't a summation of the story behind kingdom hearts birth by sleep <laughs> could be <laughs> but uh that's all i remember that character and i remember that the plot of the, the book was that they were uh trying to stop some 
like evil villain from uh, setting off a time bomb, but it wasn't a bomb that would explode after a certain amount of time. It was a bomb that would destroy the concept of time. Well, why did he want to do that? I don't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was the Japanese descendant of a uh, 21st century astrophysicist, Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's dumb. <laughs> I uh, I read a book in it was fifth grade. We read it, and it was a, a sim, just like yours. It was a sci fi book that I really liked, and it was like a, a novel. And uh, I cannot for the life of me remember what it's called, or the characters' names, or anything like that. I've tried like hell to search for it on Google, just using vague things I remembered about the story, and just typing that in. It's to no avail. And it was, like, about this kid who I think his mom is some kind of uh, environmental scientist. And they're going to go down onto this. They're in a spaceship, like a, a cruiser, like uh, the Enterprise or something, you know, for... for, for um, Long-term space exploration. Long-term space exploration. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and they're just going to go down to this planet we've newly discovered and colonized and there's breathable air and all that stuff and we have rudimentary structures and livable area on there and she goes, he goes down with her and they land on the planet and he's like, it's sort of tropical and beach like and there's like, there's, it describes these alien beaches with like purple oceans and mm. like what I remember sticking out to me as a kid was just like the alien landscape sounding so cool mm. and this kid just gets to go and explore it while his mom's at work on this <laughs> alien planet and there's like some kind of hover go uh, hover golf cart that he gets to drive around in <laughs> I thought you said hover goat <laughs> <laughs> some sort of hover goat <laughs> I, I just imagined uh, like a regular goat but he's got those little uh, like hover pads on his feet and a Jordy LaForge visor <laughs> Just hovering through the the countryside. It's not even uh, like repulsor lift, like in Star Wars or anything. It's like the he both his front goat legs and his back goat legs are on one of those hoverboard skateboard <laughs> things that the youth select now that the, explode. The, the totally not a hoverboard. Yeah, the thing that it's funny to watch Darth Vader fall off of. Yeah. Yeah, that's why they actually call it the hoverboard. It's referring to the uh, one second of hovering that the person writing it does while they're <laughs> flying off of it. You hover straight to the ground. <laughs> Careening straight into the cement because it lithium blew you sky high. But um, the kid is on the planet and he goes through the jungle and I think he's like not supposed to wander around. He's only supposed to stay in like the resort area where they live because that's where it's colonized and the rest mm. of the planet is like sort of unexplored in a jungle. And they don't think there's intelligent life there, and it just but it does describe like all the cool like alien insects and alien birds and alien stuff like that that he sees. And I just I thought that was so cool when I was a kid. Yeah. And uh, he meets in a clearing a member of the dominant species of the planet that are like sentient and they're not they're not warlike. They're not uh, like the humans are on our planet. We got to kill them all. And, uh, but they're more like, why are the humans here? Why are they fucking things up? Can you explain why they're fucking things up? And he uh, sort of learns to get along with them, learns their customs and language, and hangs out with them, sneaks away to learn more about their life and meet with them in the woods. And eventually I think he bridges the gap and introduces the colonist people that he's with, with the species, and they're like, oh... This place has intelligent life after all. Sorry. Better kill him. Yep. Yeah, in real life, that's what it would be like. Bust out the plasma rifles. Yeah. Time for, uh, <laughs> bust out the plasma rifles and smallpox blankets. It's, uh, <laughs> it's time to depopulate this alien well, dude, world. Dude, it's the future. Come on. People are more civilized than that. They're the turbo pox blankets. <laughs> <laughs> They're much more deadly. It's space pox. Yep. <laughs> Humanity's newest uh, conundrum is to try and figure out the best possible way to exaggerate the f uh, the features of the new alien race to make racist drawings <laughs> uh, and art, oh God. and to think up a new slur for them. <laughs> Goddamn Blorgs, <laughs> taking our jobs, taking our jobs on their planet. We we are gonna build a wall around the entire planet. <laughs> And the whole thing's just a cylinder. Just a giant space cylinder. <laughs> they end up in creating a Dyson sphere. Yeah. And then everything works out better. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, Dyson spheres are like my favorite uh, like ultra like mega space concept. 
Just because, like, could you imagine... Something that big? Yeah, the like... The scale of it is terrifying. Like, could yeah. you imagine just looking up and just your whole entire sky is just... That. Earth. Of course, uh, like, it'd be absolutely impossible to build a Dyson Sphere just because, like... The sheer amount of materials mean you would need a second planet to well, make it. Like, not even material-wise, it's more just, like... The physics. Uh, yeah, problem. exactly. The the tops of the sphere would spin faster than the middle of the sphere. So mm -hmm. it would just rip itself apart <laughs> from the gravitational force um, without any sort of way for it to, like, move on its own. And so, like, a lot of people proposed, like, various, like, ring worlds instead and stuff like that. But, like, I, which I actually prefer just because that would be even more striking to see <laughs> looking up in the sky and the sky has stripes. Yeah. Like, that'd be really neat. Like, uh, when you look up towards the horizon in the Halo, the first Halo game, and you're exactly. like, this it's is like, fucking awesome. This is still a cool concept, and they haven't turned these games into a beat-to-hell uh, dead alien horse. <laughs> I mean, like, that's why I hope, for the love of God, we all manage somehow to survive uh, the next few decades and, you know, things sort of stay on the same progress route. Because, like, I'd love to take my grandchildren to go see the space elevator. I think that'd be really fucking cool. Mm -hmm. Just, like, could you imagine something that tall? Yeah. Like, it'd be like, whoa. I'd love to see that. I'd also, uh, like, to have, uh, they would be robot grandchildren, because mm -hmm. uh, I don't think uh, the women of the future will have standards so high <laughs> that even an Adonis like myself. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, I killed the conversation with Space Wonder. B Rai, you wanted to talk about Charles Martinet or whatever. Oh, Maurice LaMarche. That's the one. Yeah, he's a voice actor. He does a lot of work on, I, I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. I, I don't know. I've never heard it. <laughs> Uh, spoken aloud yeah, correctly. Yeah, it's pronounced uh, Lamarche. Yeah, the probably. Lampshade boy. Um, <laughs> but he was the narrator. We watched, um, for for people listening, he's on Futurama, he's Kif, he's Calculon, he's like every other stock person they meet. Uh, is is he Morbo? Yeah, I'm, I'm like 90% sure he's Morbo. Morbo! All humans are vermin in the eyes of Morbo. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> but we watched uh, a Miyazaki classic that I've never seen before. Uh, I knew of its existence for the last ten years, just never watched it. Pom Poco. Pom Poco? You never heard of Pom Poco? I never heard of Pom Pei Loco. What's that? <laughs> it's, a, it's a Miyazaki movie, or at least it's from Studio Ghibli. Uh, and it's about Tanuki. Oh! And uh, they can transform, and it shows, like... The real animals at times, like photorealistic and everything, and then when they see each other, they're sort of like cartoony and they wear like little clothes and <laughs> oh. stuff and they talk to each other and uh, they learn they're sort of in this woodland area that's going to be developed for housing mm -hmm. in Japan. And they're like, we gotta find a way to save. It's sort of Fern Gully esque. They're yeah. like, we gotta find a way to just scare the humans off so they leave us alone. <laughs> and uh, they end up actually kind of straight up killing some humans. Oh, you know. <laughs> and it's a really cute, fun movie, but it's kind of sad. And uh, it has. Do they win in the end? Sort of. They more of just like everything oh. goes to shit, and they find oh, a way to shit. adapt. Shit yeah. doesn't go Watership Down, does it? No. Oh. It, uh, actually, I've never seen Watership Down, and and that Good. is by design. <laughs> Uh, but Maurice LaMarche yeah so he was the narrator of that movie and he's narrating things from the Pompoko side that movie the English voice cast has like the entire cast of Futurama <laughs> really? it's hysterical <laughs> uh, the main female uh, it's like sort of elder Tanuki who's sort of like a mother figure that they all look to is voiced by Tress McNeil so she sounds exactly <laughs> like mom uh. <laughs> And, uh, Seymour! <laughs> and, yeah, her. And, uh, the. Who else? Maurice LaMarche, is, as I mentioned, is the narrator. John DiMaggio does a lot of just stock voices in it and various characters. Yeah. And, uh, the, the movie is great because the Tanuki learn how to, like, do the shape shifting thing that they're known for in folklore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they're just like. We're gonna have to learn how to do that again, so we can scare the humans away. They think we're just fairy tales that we can do that. Well, let's learn how to do it and scare the shit out of them. <laughs> and so they do, and they they practice learning how to transform. So wait, this is a Miyazaki movie about Scooby Doo villains. 
<laughs> no. Well, Except for the of. villains or the heroes. Yes. Time. And they're not trying to scare people off the land because there's like... A pirate pi- treasure pirate, buried. Yeah, pirate gold there. <laughs> and they don't go... <laughs> and try to grab people. <laughs> or sc- scream like a cougar despite being a vampire. <laughs> Uh, watching Scooby Doo has gotten way better oh, as God. I've gotten older. Oh, it's so funny! Oh. <laughs> it's so funny <laughs> for all the reasons they didn't intend. Yeah. No, of course not. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I watched a lot of Scooby Doo when I was growing up, just because it was on Cartoon Network. Because the episodes were cheap and they already owned them, so they aired it during the day. So when you they just hunker down with your Dunkaroos and you said, "I'm ready for Scoobert Doobert." Yep. <laughs> So I've seen all the episodes a bunch of times. <laughs> and your nanny was like... <laughs> um, I was going to say something else about Pompoka. Oh, uh, all the raccoons. Here's the part that uh, is on statues of Tanuki. Ah, I know it's coming. Weird ball sack powers. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. And they keep that in the movie, a children's animated movie. <laughs> Probably why it's not hugely well known yeah. in the States. <laughs> it's the ball sack raccoon movie. <laughs> and uh, one, of the, one of the raccoons, who is uh, voiced by Clancy Brown. Uh, if you don't know who that is, you'd know his voice the second you heard it. Clancy Brown, Clancy Brown. He was Ooh. Captain Black on Jackie Chan Adventures. Continue. Uh, he <laughs> he kills a guy. Oh, uh, with his nuts. So, yes. Whoa! I was joking. He, he, there is a part where he he leads like the the faction of the raccoons. That's like no to hell with scaring the humans. We gotta like really hurt some of them to fight them off by force. So you yeah. know we can't just rely on them learning to respect us and backing off that way. And they're like, you're being too rash. You, you can't just go around killing people <laughs> with your nutsack. <laughs> there are rules like, in place to prevent this. I even like think this is how like <laughs> most strike teams have this conversation <laughs> in, the back, in the back room, in the briefing room. You can't, just, you can't just nut folk to death. <laughs> Did he kill him with a tactical tea bag? <laughs> <laughs> these goddamn <Sactical>? liberals... <laughs> these goddamn liberals want nutsack control. <laughs> a three-day waiting period for <laughs> nutsack. Can't have a nutsack on a school campus. <laughs> He's got damn uh, salt testicles. What, what's really bad is how how difficult they make it for you to get a concealed carry. Yeah. <laughs> you, got, you, you, just, you just gotta keep him out until you, you get that concealed. You walk around open carrying your nutsack. Yep. I mean, you can walk around Harris Teeter that way. It's, it is legal, but everyone's gonna frown on it. Yep. Yeah, man. Last time I open carried my nutsack in a Taco Bell, everybody was giving me a stink eye. I tell ya, this fucking shit's <laughs> oppressive, dog. I blame, uh, I blame the Obama administration. Obama. Obama. I don't know. That was a bad testy joke. How do you kill somebody with a nuts, be eye? <laughs> How do you murder with a nut nut? Uh, so they just he and the the rash raccoons that want to uh, attack people start doing that and they they pick like a rainy night to sabotage a bunch of like the trucks that are they're driving in materials and equipment to like you know start the development Uh uh-huh and uh they a couple of them like transform into kids and like run in the middle of the road and like the truck's like ah and like swerves (laughs) off the road and uh you know they do various things to make the trucks crash and there's a truck that's driving along he's got a bunch of logs and stuff on there and the raccoon straight up jumps because they have transforming powers and expanding powers and the expanding powers center around their nut sacks. Uh, I'm not kidding. <laughs> he leaps off of like an embankment onto the top of the truck mm-hmm. and then like spreads his nut sack out so it covers the entire windshield and that obscures the driver's vision and he's like ah! and it's like screeching and he's like go crashing all over the road and his nut sack is covering the windshield. <laughs> <laughs> He crashes the truck off the road. This sounds like and Gremlins 2. I'm not going to lie to you. This movie just sounds like the Miyazaki Gremlins it's, 2. It's beautifully animated. And it's a Studio Ghibli masterpiece in every sense of the word. And I'm not even kidding. Like, I mean no sarcastic... It's just, it's the classic, I mean, they're on point, as always, because yeah. they're, they're giblets. And uh, then, like, the next thing, you don't you don't see the guy die, like, straight up die. <laughs> you see the truck crash, and it's pretty bad looking. And then, like, the next thing is, like, the raccoons huddled around the TV that they uh, have, because they have a TV. And uh, it's like, 
three a, a series of accidents in the rural area took the lives of three <laughs> workers, including a truck driver or something. And they're like, yeah, <laughs> and I'm like, he straight up. Straight up nut murdered. There's a there's a part later where the same raccoons. Uh, this is a spoiler alert for if anyone who wants to to watch. Uh, yeah, they eventually reach a point where there's a showdown between the raccoons and riot police with shields and helmets and batons, <laughs> and the raccoons inflate their nut sacks and bounce on them. <laughs> like hippity hops. Like like that episode of Futurama. I keep going back to Futurama, but where there there is the ball aliens and they yeah. bounce on people. They do that with their inflated nut sacks and they like roll over uh, like the annoying levels of Crash Bandicoot where the giant boulder attacks you. They do that to <laughs> cops, only it's, instead of a boulder, it's their giant scrot all blown up. Oh my god. But that's only part of what the movie is about. Oh. It's only partially about scrotums. Yeah. It's, it's about the duality but of man. All of them do have very visible scrotums when they're standing around and sitting around, even when the scrotums are not currently being used <laughs> to magically attack people. <laughs> You best look out, I'm gonna sick my attack scroll on you. <laughs> Get out of my yard. Nards of danger. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing you know you know what's the weirdest thing of all? What? I didn't laugh once while watching this movie. <laughs> I took it in as a serious film, and it wasn't until later that I started to think about the fact that just watched a movie where a bunch of cute cartoon animals killed people with their nut sacks. <laughs> <laughs> and the absurdity therein <laughs> struck me. Oh my god. What the... Ah! <laughs> this is like... This is like intense culture shock right here. This is like... This is like... <laughs> <laughs> He's overcome this with no the testicular giggles. It's probably not well known in America because of the uh, amount of ball sacks yeah. that are present and, and really present in a way that you can't edit out or gloss over. Yeah. They're, just, yeah. they're central oh, to the plot. Four kids would find a way to do it. They make them all like glowing and green and be like, it's <laughs> our energy attacks. Yeah. Uh, I, the, I the just whole... imagine that um, you got the, like, the Disney executives. They have their new... Uh, the new Miyazaki movie's done, and they're like, "Okay, uh, we can afford to dub one of one of these two Miyazaki movies uh, this year. We can either go with Ponyo, a delightful story about a little fish girl and some wizards and oceans and stuff, or the uh, the the movie where Tanukis kill a whole bunch of people with their nutsacks. Which one do you want to do, guys? Which one uh, has <laughs> appealed to you?" And the frozen-headed Disney's like, "I like the nutsack one." <laughs> <laughs> The executives just watched the, uh, we got two new Miyazaki movies here, or the new Miyazaki film is finished, let's put it on, and they just watch it, and it's the nutsack attack, where they're mm. just fighting riot police with their balls. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, oh god, <laughs> Miyazaki's gone senile. <laughs> <laughs> Turn it off. No, <laughs> Japanese Colonel Sanders, Why did don't we, go senile. Why did we ever buy the rights to this property? We bought the rights to this before we realized what the content was. Because yeah. we're so used to Miyazaki's films being blockbusting gold. <laughs> and uh, now said they were nut busting gold. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the name of the episode. Nut busting gold. Nut busting gold. Oh boy. <laughs> um, there's other people from Futurama that are in that though. I don't know, maybe that's everybody, but it's just, it's really, really obviously Maurice LaMarche, and I was like, that's that's him. That's him. <laughs> yes. And the Tanuki people crush them with their powerful nut sacks. <laughs> I heard him in a car commercial recently, and what? I was like, what? It, it sounded like Calculon did a Volvo ad. <laughs> It's like he's peddling his great great grandfather. Yeah. Yo! Snap! That was a good one right there. <laughs> acting unit two and uh, acting unit two seven one. David, David Duchovny. Duchovny. <laughs> this episode sponsored by Futurama. Catch a new season. Never because it's over, dude. Mm -hmm. That being said, like I don't, I, I don't blame Maurice for doing these things. It's work. Yeah. It's dude, work. gotta eat, man. It's work. It's good work. And dude, gotta eat. You gotta sell cars. You gotta sell tanuki balls. You gotta if, do it all. If baby. you offered me what he probably made for that commercial and for those movies, 
tomorrow to hell yes. <laughs> yeah. If all it took was voice in a car, man, and I got, I can get a car, man. Then a I can, man car. i will do it. Ah. Oh, someday I'll be a man car. <laughs> Where'd Taylor go? He's dead. Oh. Finally. <laughs> oh, guys! Jesus Christ, I was there for centuries! <laughs> Longer than you think, Dad! <laughs> Longer than you think! <laughs> now, that is yeah. from a classically spooky fucking story you called You actually the read jaunt, it so you can explain it. it. Yeah, well, Stephen jaunt. King's The Jaunt. <clears throat> it's, which uh, sounds a lot, which is a lot less jaunty than it sounds. Yes, it's not a jaunty tale. No, no siree. It's uh, named after the method of <laughs> teleportation, transportation... From uh, Alfred Bester's The Star's My Destination, which is another very good sci-fi story that I own and read. It's from the 50s. Uh, anyhow, uh, The Jaunt by Stephen King. <laughs> Sorry, I had to kill a man with my nutsack. <laughs> what, if, what if in the next Red Dead Redemption... <laughs> That's all I had to say. <laughs> That's all I had to say. Oh. It's just the dual mode. You challenge. I don't like the way you're looking at me, partner. Let's take this outside. I'm calling because it's going to be Red Dead Redemption 2. Joseph Marston's nut busting goal. <laughs> There's <laughs> balls in them there. <laughs> What happens in the jaunt, be right? <laughs> what happens in the jaunt? Do people have nuts? I assume so, and they get transported interdimensionally. <laughs> uh, the jaunt takes place in the near slash far future. It's a science fiction story. The far off future of two thousand two. Exactly. It's actually the jaunt is the scariest story I've ever read. Uh, it is serious, and I read a lot of scary shit because I love that kind of thing. Um, but the jaunt is the scariest story I've ever read in my life. And not so much because there's a thing in it that gets people or any any kind of monster or ghost or boogin. But, uh... <clears throat> boogin. It's the concepts in there that really get to you when you think about it. Uh, so it's like the far future and humanity has discovered teleportation technology. And we can, we can teleport now. And the method of teleportation that we've discovered, we call it jaunting. And uh, it's allowed us to make a lot of progress in a short period of time. Like, society is to totally globalized. Uh, you know, we've colonized the moon through jaunting because we no how longer have to worry about rockets and all that stuff because we could just straight up teleport shit there. And because it works. <clears throat> and uh, the thing about the jaunt is it's, it's like teleportation through some sort of rift in space time. And. Uh, when they were developing it, they put rats through it. And, like, you know, like the way we test most things, we test it with animals first. And the rats they would put through the jaunt, they would, like, teleport them from one side of the lab to the other side of the room, and they would be medically and physically completely fine. All their organs were in the right place, all their blood was in their body, they weren't fucked up horribly or torn asunder. They were, they were fine and alive, but they just acted really, really weird when they came out of the jaunt. And it happened every time. They'd send a rat through the jaunt, he'd be like, whoop, across the room, and he'd just be acting so weird, and then he'd just starve himself to death. And so then they got the idea to sedate the rat before they sent it through the jaunt. And they did that, and the rat woke up and was completely fine. So they were like, oh, well, this is a clear night and day difference here. Uh, mm -hmm. This is enough data to know that we should never, ever send a human awake through the jaunt. So they... Uh, always sedate people before they send them through the jaunt. And because of that, nobody knows what it's like when you're actually in the dimension. Uh, of, or, you know, if you're even in a dimension, what, what exactly happens to you while you're being teleported. Yeah. And uh, so enter our protagonists. It is a young, uh, all-American, nuclear, or whatever, whatever country the entire Earth is. Earthican. <laughs> a young, <laughs> nuclear Earthican family, and they're about to take a vacation uh, on Mars... Because they can do that, because there's teleportation. Yeah. And uh, they're all getting ready to go. And the little boy, it's going to be, like, the mom and dad have done this before, but it's going to be, like, the kid's first time jaunting, and they're all excited, and they're asking all these questions about it. 
And uh, the little boy in particular is like, what's it like inside the jaunt, Dad? And he's like, well, I don't know, Billy. They knock you the fuck out and uh, <laughs> send you through the jaunt. And what the dad doesn't tell him is that uh, there was an experiment a long time ago when they were first discovering the technology where they took a death row inmate and he was going to be executed, and they offered him a full pardon and release if he would agree to be jaunted without sedatives. And they jaunted him. He came out, and medically and physically, he was fine, just like the rats. Uh, but he immediately flatlined, and it seemed like he wanted to flatline. And, and he, he willed himself dead? <laughs> yeah, and he only spoke one sentence, and he just said, It's eternity in there. Ooh. And... Uh, then he, he died. And the dad doesn't tell the little boy about that because he's like, we're going to be fine. And, and and also, like needless to say, they can teleport materials and tools and vehicles and all that. Any yeah. any kind of non-living matter is completely fine mm-hmm. to John. And that's why they're able to colonize space because they just teleport the materials there. You don't have to fly it there in a rocket. Yeah. And uh, so the little boy, they're <clears> being <throat> given like some kind of sleeping gas to like knock them out for the jaunt after they've packed and all that and they're ready to set off. And the little boy holds his breath because he wants to go through the jaunt without uh, being sedated. And in real life, if it was this like crucial, they would make it something that you couldn't opt out of. Yeah. Like, they would inject you yeah. in some non-negotiable way. <laughs> They'd put you in the sleep helmet. Yeah. They'd just give you a whack with a Louisville slugger. <laughs> <laughs> so the kid fakes being asleep. They go through the jaunt. They wake up on Mars. Everyone's happy. And then the kid... Starts cackling, and he has white hair and, like, yellowed corneas and long nails. <laughs> and he just looks at the father and says, Longer than you think, Dad. Longer than you think. And then he claws his own eyes out. Whoa. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> ah, it wouldn't be a Stephen King story without somebody, without a child getting butchered. Yep. Ah, but yes, that's like a kind of like a cosmic horror sort of kind of scary. Not like a booga booga, but yeah. like a, oh, Jesus. Oh, no. <laughs> like the I, jaunt, I think it's described as just an endless, silent field of white <clears throat> forever. Oh. For like a billion years. Yeah. It's a billion years of white here at the jaunt. Steve Bennett says, sign me up. <laughs> I get it. Oh, it's that joke about white supremacy. <laughs> An eternity of whiteness. I'm there. <laughs> He comes out of the jaunt awake and he's just like, ah, oh, put me back. That wasn't long enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he wakes up and the first thing he sees is his jaunt technician is Asian. He just put me back. <laughs> wow. I haven't seen one of you karate people in, in, in 4,000 centuries. And that wasn't long enough. I love how we went from uh, cosmic existential horror to... Uh, Real fun. horror that we're all sitting through right now in this country. <laughs> a billion years of non-stop white. <laughs> Especially b who's very pale. Yep. <laughs> I reflect sunlight, and it uh, even hurts my own eyes. <laughs> I'm uh, Actually, if, if you're wanting to know what I look like, um, the monk from the Da Vinci Code was based on me. <laughs> <laughs> that guy was spooky. I liked him a lot. They made him they made him spooky looking. The Da Vinci Code pissed off a lot of people. It pissed off like a lot of albinos who were like, we're not like stock character freak monsters that attack people. Like you yeah. can't just make someone albino when you want to make them more interesting and scary. That's shitty. Yeah. And then like the Opus Day people who he was supposed to be a monk in the order of were like, none of this is accurate. We don't do this. And we certainly don't go around murdering people because they <laughs> think Jesus might have had a girlfriend. <laughs> I don't know. I killed a man over that once. Did you kill him with your nutsack? Yes. See, now, because of the incident with the Tanuki, uh, <clears throat> Japan now issues protective gear to its riot squads that are uh, nutsack-proof. <laughs> <laughs> Sack-proof a shield. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing they don't tell you, is that uh, a bulletproof vest will stop a bullet, but a nutsack is just going to slice right through it. <laughs> <laughs> Kevlar doesn't do shit against nutsacks. <laughs> Oh my 
god. <laughs> Kevlar doesn't do shit. That's, I like it. What are you doing? I'm hiding. <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to do? I, that, I don't know. <laughs> I'm feeling loopy, man. I'm feeling I'm crazy. Shit. Maybe it's the fumes in this, <laughs> this room where you paint your Japanese robot. <laughs> All I got is spray paint everywhere. It's no problem. <laughs> Huff it straight from the bag. <laughs> it makes nice little pits in your brain where happiness lives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. It's what I love. I'll die doing what I love. <laughs> Painting Japanese robots. So you have to uh, give yourself a form of spongiform encephalopathy uh, with harsh chemicals in order to... Uh, let in the positive emotions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> gotta let in the happy when you're doing the Gundam paint. You, you just gotta just sniff it up there. Hey, you don't have a happy you won't get in. This is a weird voice. I found. It's a great and terrifyingly accurate <laughs> voice. <laughs> of what? That sounded like something. Uh, What's it accurate? One of the many that... homeless in Richmond would slur at you from a <laughs> oh. bench. It's just. That exact voice with those those exact words. You gotta, it makes you happy with the Gundam paint. <laughs> That's the voice of your uh, superhero superhero alter ego, Huffman, <laughs> with the power to huff paint. <laughs> Not huff the magic dragon. <laughs> quickly, uh, uh, Huffman quickly forgets what he's doing when he's chasing after <laughs> malcontents. <laughs> Huffman, the bank's been robbed. What? Huffman, time to go into action. <laughs> what are we doing again? Huffman, you gonna you gonna stop that shit? <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> we got in a weird area. <laughs> The power of Huffman. Ah! Huff Huffman, the Home Depot's being robbed. I'm on it! <laughs> <laughs> he runs in, he uh, he punches out the first cashier that he sees and goes straight to the, uh, the paint, paint aisle. <laughs> say, you see like the grainy silent security camera footage. Of, there's just like a gunman walking up and down, like angrily addressing like a bunch of people with like the aprons on their on their yeah. knees with their hands up and then behind him you see like the doors open and Huffman runs in runs past the whole scene <laughs> and then like runs back out on the silent footage with his arms filled with <laughs> <laughs> Just, nobody notices <laughs> <laughs> He's like a cryptid or like Bigfoot. He just yeah. doesn't show up properly on any kind of uh, <laughs> any kind of recording media. Then, uh -huh. Well, no, I mean he shows up properly. It's just nobody who's in the actual scene yeah. pays any attention to him while he's doing this. <laughs> He's laid out, sprawled out. He's his face is all orange and blue and pink, <laughs> and he's just got these like gross clothes that he slept in all week and he's just laying there and there's used up cans of empties around him <laughs> and uh there's like a lady walking home from work and like you know the scuzzy looking you know stereotypical atavistic bugs bunny criminal with like the lamp jaw and the five o'clock shadow and the the, the stripey uh and the striped uniform. shirt and the domino mask lady give me your wall give me your purse or i'll cut you and he has like the switchblade and he's like I'm not going to tell you twice. Woes! And he slips on a can of spray paint and falls and busts his head and then like Huffman just wakes up and goes, you're welcome. <laughs> a little day is saved by Huffman. His, uh, his superhero disguise is a cowl like Batman style, but uh... <laughs> The, the the part of exposed flesh is always a different color, so like no, like, like you can't even pin down his race or anything because he's always green or blue. It's the perfect disguise until he has to like take it off real quick and he shows up and it's like, dude, what's why is your mouth all green? Yeah. He's like, I ate a lichen on the way to work. <laughs> There's just a guy at work in an office building. He's like his Clark Kent, and his face is just smeared. He's in a business suit, but his face is smeared. As you can see, the quarterly projections from this. <laughs> You're like, uh, Simmons, what's up with your face, man? He's like, I always look like this. <laughs> this is normal. 
You well. can't you can't say this isn't normal. I always look like this. I'm not Huffman. You're right. He's not Huffman. He can't be Huffman. Why did I even think that? <laughs> they would just say, "Who the hell is Huffman?" <laughs> <laughs> Huffman is like, uh, to the police blotter to take an eye, uh, to keep an eye on the city. And like, he's reading over like the descriptions of various robberies. And he's like, oh, what, what, what a dastardly fiend. But it's all stuff he did. <laughs> <laughs> like all, of the, all of the reported crimes are him. By daytime, he's a petty criminal. And then by nighttime, he's a superhero. <laughs> but he's always tracking his own crimes that he doesn't realize he did. <laughs> Oh, you just <laughs> guys, we just created an origin story for Florida Man. I hope you realize. <laughs> he says, Ronald Reagan closed my mental hospital. <laughs> and this is what I'm left with. <laughs> and his uh, sidekick and ward, uh, paint chip lad. <clears throat> lead the, paint chip lad. Because the lead tastes good. The lead tastes good two times. Once on your tongue and then again on your brain. It bonds with your atoms instead of carbon and permanently prevents you from being able to metabolize needed uh, elements. For fun. Wait, really? Is that yeah, that's, that's that how lead poisoning, poisoning works. works? Because I think it's carbon, but it's like the, the atom shape is the same shape as something that we're our body knows to bind with and use, mm. but it binds with lead instead. Mm. And once it binds with lead, it can't unbind with lead, oh. and it permanently prevents us from being able to and take more of the needed element. Yeah. And so it fucks us up real oh. bad. It's like it's like when iron forms in a star. It's just all over. So to uh, change the subject a little bit, I've been um, thinking up some pitches for uh, various TV shows. And uh, namely, I have a, a game show slash reality show idea that I want to run past you guys. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and feel free to interject with any kind of suggestions for it. Mm. But, uh... This one I call, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Uh Uh-huh. Now, you may be thinking that's already a game show, Adam, hosted by our own Regis Philbin. (laughs) But (laughs) this is a game show and a reality show. (laughs) And the reality part of it is that each contestant is chosen Mm -hmm. at random, Mm -hmm. and their objective is to infiltrate the life of a millionaire and replace them. (laughs) They literally become a millionaire. (laughs) And uh, it's it's through any means possible. They can get plastic surgery. They can um, <laughs> uh, do any kind of changes that one might need to impersonate whoever this millionaire that they've been chosen to high, impersonate. High quality for. disguise kit. Yep, uh, disguise uh, kits. Uh, the best um, uh, makeup and uh, prosthetic people around. Transsexual surgeries. Yep. Are they allowed to murder the millionaire, skin him, and then dance around with a chainsaw on a rural Texas road? They're allowed to, but uh, I'll just say that in the first episode, someone tries that, and it it, it doesn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's very very hard to actually look like someone despite wearing their skin. Coming up next, Brandon's plot to wear the millionaire's skin doesn't work out as expected. <laughs> <laughs> But can he can he take it back in round two? <laughs> I'm trying to think of millionaires and my mind is running blank. Well, I'm pretty sure there's like just a lot of millionaires. Any kind of uh, a doctor or <clears throat> dentist or anyone with a high paying job and good money sense. Mm. So like we're not doing high profile. Uh, um, what's the guy? The guy that just died that had like five thousand uh, oh, transplants. Oh, uh, Ro- Waka Flocka. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're not we're not going to be impersonating the the Rockefellers. <laughs> I, said, I, said I know what you said. <laughs> but yeah, Waka Flocka can be on there too. <laughs> but the uh, the objective is to um, er- erase the original millionaire and replace them with yourself. <laughs> and uh, if you win, then like. You did that, and now you have their life and all their money. <laughs> Are you encouraged and their to family. sort of 
and their family. Are you allowed to, uh, if you want to, sort of gradually incorporate elements of your own life into their life so you can still have your same stuff? Yeah, once uh, once the show is over, you can do whatever you want. You can just, uh, you have their identity. That's the prize. Do you have their power of eternity? Yes, in, uh, because the... Uh, the I said ri- power of eternity. <laughs> Longer than you think. <laughs> yeah. Waka. Longer than you think, Regis, because this will be hosted by Regis Philbin. Ah! Even if we have to surprise him a bunch and then cut out various words from the epithets he yells at us to assemble them into a coherent narrative, which we can then use to host the program. Now I think about it, is Regis Philbin a a millionaire? Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, you're one step ahead of me because the season finale... Ah! The contestant has to become Regis Philbin. (laughs) And Regis Philbin doesn't know. (laughs) He's narrating the events, but he's still surprised by them. <laughs> like, in the sound. What are you doing? Get out of there! Yeah. Hey! <laughs> and meet our new contestant, Jerry Simmons. Here he is. Oh, as he's just stabbed in the back. <laughs> and as he puts on, like, a latex mask of Regis Philbin. <laughs> All right, it's it, like a novelty mask, too. It's, like, huge. Yeah. But, like, nobody can tell the difference. Yeah. So he just goes about the Regis life, but everyone's just like, ha ha! And he's like, <laughs> not only is it huge, but it's a caricature of him as well. Of course. So like he's got big ears and a huge <laughs> nose or whatever <laughs> defining, um, exaggeratable trait Regis Philbin has. Yeah, none of us are caricature artists. Yeah. I think you, oh, all Regis, of you at home might discover. Just put him on a skateboard or something. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Miguel uh, Mako and Mermaid. <laughs> you know, Regis, I love how your muffled voice and stiff mouth is. Uh... <laughs> the way it's captured in the moonlight, it's very romantic. <laughs> yeah, have you noticed how Regis's lips don't move when he talks ever since that season finale? Yeah, and I like it. <laughs> he had a stroke. Don't call attention to it, you asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's. The... <laughs> Why does his head get so big? The same reason. That's what happens when you get a stroke. <laughs> Hello, check WebMD sometime. <laughs> Cranial exaggeration and cartoonification These are real <laughs> syndromes that happen to people. You're fucking, you're a disgrace. <laughs> there was a man wearing an Obama mask uh, screaming in Central Park saying, I'm the president! Why won't anyone help me? <laughs> You know, I think that's a good way to get help. <laughs> just like, that's better than 911. You just go outside in your Obama mask and scream that. Somebody will call somebody. <laughs> Did I ever tell you guys about the time that I killed a man? Yes. Yeah, it was for too- fun. Yeah, for fun. <laughs> oh. oh that, that was Rob a guy. Oh, it's Rob a guy. For <laughs> fun. When I was just a young boy, my mama told me, son, always be a good boy, don't ever play with guns. But I killed a man in Reno with my nutsack just to watch him die. (laughs) More nutsack-related humor will be heard next time, perhaps uh, on the next episode of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, or maybe... On the next episode of Frankenstein Control. Say goodnight, everybody. Good night. <laughs> I fucking hate you guys. Now, even you know I am a menace. I hand you the secret to save the entire human race and the entire universe. <laughs>